session. We had a lecture from, excellent lecture from Dr. Salter last session. Now we're going to have a more conversation where hopefully we can have more questions from you guys and we're each going to talk for about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm Jeremy Horpital, I'm a professor here in economics, also affiliated with the Arkansas Center for Research and Economics. I told you a little about, a bit about us last session, but we're co-sponsoring this event with the Arkansas Policy Foundation. So Frank Kaza is here uh, from APF. He's going to just tell us a little bit about that organization, and then we'll get into the discussion about it. So thank you, Frank. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Alden, for coming out today. Uh, Arkansas Policy Foundation is a nonprofit 501c3 think tank created in 1995. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary. We uh, publish research. We give it away for free. To the public, we have a website, www.arkansaspolicyfoundation.org. We interact with uh, students, we play on forums, we interact with policymakers, we try to uh, expose them to good public policy ideas, we interact with news media. And we'd love to hear from all of you, and we uh, thank you again for having us here today. Thank you. You also brought some, oh, yes. some books, and I see some nickels, so maybe you'll, you'll tell us about that later, but some free nickels. So, um, and, and a few books left, gave a lot from my last session. Um, thanks everyone, so we're just going to talk for about 10 minutes. I'm Jeremy Horpital, I'll go first. Uh, Greg, you're going to go second, then, and Professor Salter will go third. So we'll each talk over for about 10 minutes. Uh, the discussion is scheduled to go until 4. Maybe for some of you that this is your class period, maybe you need to leave a little early and we understand, but uh, we'll try to keep the conversation going until about 4 o'clock. Um, so we'll talk collectively for 30 minutes, then we'll have um, you know, a little bit more than that to take your questions and feedback. Um, so I want to just talk to you, and I, my handout is the one that's stapled, and it's three sheets with two graphs and text on the first page. Uh, it should be enough for everyone. If you haven't seen one of their stack, please keep passing around. Um, just to give you a little bit of history, and this I think complements what Dr. Selter was, some of the things he was talking about. Um, what I see as kind of the three monetary systems the United States have had. Uh, talked a little bit about, or quite a bit about what we currently have, but mentioned a few of the uh, previous systems. So uh, I just wanted to kind of group these, and there's kind of four things I've listed here, but one of them is not really a system. So uh, basically, before the creation of the Federal Reserve, I see that as kind of one system, even though there's a lot of changes happening. So basically, before 1913, uh, the United States had uh, some form of a commodity standard. Uh, based on one or more metals, metals being gold, silver, or both. And it changed at different times which one was dominant, and the ratios between gold and silver changed. But for my purposes here, we'll just treat those all as one thing. Um, so um, before 1913, uh, the first graph that I have attached there uh, basically shows you what happened to the value of the dollar over that whole time period. And what you can see over that whole time period is basically the value of the dollar didn't change at all if we look over the entire time period. Although you notice that uh, from year to year, and especially during certain decades, there are lots of fluctuations in the value of the dollar and how much one dollar can purchase. Uh, but uh, essentially no change over this more than 100 year period, or you might think of it as all the 19th century. Uh, or if we focus on a particular period, say from 1873 to 1913, uh, and I think this is an important period of time because not only is the United States essentially on a gold standard during this period, uh, but most of what we call today the developed world, so Western Europe um, and, and Western Europe's offshoots, uh, were mostly on the same commodity standard. So we had what we would today call uh, a kind of gold exchange standard. Um, and a gold standard, if you're not familiar with it, is some sort of standard where the money is linked to gold, it's convertible to gold, it's based on gold. And there are lots of different types of gold standards. There's, or you can tell us all the details of that, but, but for our purposes here, they're, they're, they're similar. Uh, what you can see from that period, uh, that 40 year time period, uh, the value of the dollar actually increased every year on average by about 0.5%. Uh, so this is totally different from the system we have today where we're used to the value of a dollar decreasing every year, right? We're used to inflation. Uh, deflation was the norm in that period, which is a period mostly of peace worldwide, of uh, economic stability and economic growth. Uh, so you can kind of see that's kind of the tail end then of the graph is uh, the US dollar increasing in value and decreasing a little, but on average uh, increasing in value by about a half a percent a year. Uh, so before the 20th century, before any of us were alive, uh, people did not expect inflation. We all expect that now. We all expect, and, and if you don't know this, you're seeing this kind of a, a, a social pariah who doesn't understand how the economy works. Of course, 
money loses value every year. That's just the way it's always been. Well, yeah, that's the way it's always been since 1913. Uh, that's not what most of economic history looks like. So that's kind of system one. Uh, bimetallism, uh, gold standard, some sort of commodity standard is what the U.S. was on before 1913. And really, U.S. was on this up until 1934 in some sense, um, until the United States, like basically every country in the world, did abandon the gold standard. So I checked because there was a question about Canada. Canada abandoned the gold standard in 1933. Britain abandoned it in 1931. Basically in the 30s, every country starts abandoning it, um, and to the point where by the time World War II rolls around, nobody's on it. Uh, so then I have this kind of group, World War I, Roaring Twenties, Great Depression, World War II. Uh, we can't really describe what the monetary system was because it was in flux. Uh, it was screwed up. It got screwed up during World War I and they never really got back to what it was before World War I. So there's no system. And then after World War II, uh, you have what was called the Bretton Woods system, uh, which is still a system based on gold, uh, but gold is not convertible, uh, or money is not convertible to gold for individuals. And there's lots of uh, other you know, interesting features of that system. It's mostly based on the US dollar, um, and that uh, other countries can convert their currency to gold, to gold um, but uh, individuals can't. Uh, so still a kind of gold standard, but you'll notice that during that period, from 1946 to 1971, uh, this is when inflation kind of becomes normal. And the dollar fell, on average, by 3% per year in value. So kind of what it seems like we're kind of used to now, two or three percent losing value. Um, and then kind of the final system is what we have basically a day, which you know you can bookend this in different ways, but starting in 1971 or 1973 uh, till today, uh, the value of the dollar since then has fell by about four percent per year. So a little more than the Bretton Woods system. Um, and the system today is kind of interesting historically because it's not based on any commodity um, and the exchange rates between countries are variable. Uh, or floating. So that's kind of the system we have today. Um, so you might say that of those three systems, uh, if you're concerned about stability and the value of money, uh, the current system looks the worst. Although if you look at the last, just the last 20 years, uh, it's actually not quite the worst, right? So in the past 20 years or so, uh, the dollar has lost about 2% of its value per year, uh, which is slightly better than the Bretton Woods system right after World War II. So you got kind of three systems before the Fed, after World War II, up to the 70s, and then uh, the current system. And so then the second graph I have kind of, uh, you know, takes that first graph and extends it. And that's the one that kind of looks like, you know, uh, falling off a cliff here, right? That the value of the dollar, uh, especially since, you know, 1945 or 46, has dramatically declined in value. And that is not what we saw for most of recorded monetary history before that. Um, so you know, we titled this session or this forum the past, present, and future of money. There's a little bit of the past. I'm not an expert in uh, monetary economics specifically, but I do study economic history. So I thought I would just say that for my 10 minutes and uh, interested to hear your guys' questions. But first, I'd like to hear what uh, these other two guys have to say. So thank you. Greg. Sure. Well, you're the future. And if there's one thing I could do today, it's uh, leave you with these ideas to pay attention to monetary policy. Because a, a much simpler way of explaining all these abstract ideas that you've heard today and that have been expressed so eloquently is that your dollar doesn't buy as much as it used to. The whole point of the nickel is that in 1913, when this central bank was created, it bought a dollar today only buys a nickel. It's worth a nickel. And the source for that is Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, CPI, or Consumer Price Index, comma, 1913, hyphen. You'll see the chart there on their site, and you can take a look at it and understand yourself that the value of your money is less. It doesn't buy as much as it used to. Yet monetary policy is rarely discussed. It's usually, what, fiscal policy. So those of you who are studying business or economics You've, you've learned about fiscal policy, which is taxes and spending and what you read in the newspaper or see on social media or TV or hear on the radio. Very rarely do you hear these kind of ideas, monetary policy, discussed. So if I could leave you with one idea today, it's I encourage you very strongly to think about it, and not only here, but when you leave university, because it affects you, it's gonna affect whatever you do. And also, the second point is do it in a humble way. Be humble about it. 
there's a general lack of humility today on the part of the monetary authorities, I would submit to you, in considering some of these problems. And I brought a couple quotes along just to illustrate historically how monetary authorities in the United States, including here in Arkansas, have been much more humble and much more aware that, that they are human and that they don't have all the answers. And so in, in the uh, post-war era, after World War II, if you go back and look at this chart that I mentioned, from the early 50s to 1965, you see the inflation rate averages 1.4%. It's only about 3% one year. And then in the mid-60s, because of the war and spending, you see that inflation rate start to kick up. So for the last five years in the 60s, it's above 3%. And then we get to the 1970s, which today is now remembered as the decade in the 20th century with the highest average annual inflation rates, 7%. Peaking, uh, and this may surprise you today, those of you who didn't live through it, but peaking at 13.5% in 1980. 13.5%. So a Federal Reserve official in 1969 visiting Arkansas, visiting Hot Springs, Arkansas, had this to say. He admitted, the recent record of national economic stabilization policy has left much to be desired. For almost five years, we've had an accelerating inflation, which we have not arrested either for lack of will or lack of knowledge as to how to do it. Uncertainty about the role of the federal budget and about monetary policy has prevailed. Did the inflation come from federal spending and the budget deficit, monetary expansion, or from some combination? Is the cure for the inflation to be found primarily in budget policy or in monetary policy? Well, that was Daryl Francis. He was later head of a bank in, in uh, Fort Smith. He was at the time the president of the, of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, which within the Federal Reserve system was a dissident bank. They were questioning the prevailing uh, ideas about monetary policy. And in the end, because the conventional policy didn't work in the 1970s, their ideas prevailed and led to the actions that uh, Mr. Volcker took when he became Federal Reserve Chair in uh, the late 1970s and then into the early 1980s. The policies that indeed did bust the back of inflation. But he's a very humble man. He's saying we don't know, we can do better. And the other quote I had for you was from another Federal Reserve official. And this is more on the search for humility that I mentioned. Quote, nobody is very happy with the conduct of monetary policy. The economy has performed badly, particularly in terms of inflation and the large costs that go with it. And the near-term outlook for the performance of the economy is grim. Many critics accuse the monetary authorities, that is the central bank, the Federal Reserve, of failing to deal effectively with the problems we have faced. And virtually every policymaker admits that, in hindsight, we have made some mistakes that have added to our economic woes. And that was Mark Wills, who was the president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank. And he said that in Atlanta, Georgia in late 1979, December 1979. These critiques, uh, you'll, hear, you'll see them discussed in academic books. If you're, if you're more interested, I have a few. But in general, here's Mr. Wills summarizing what I'm trying to say to you and what you should be thinking about. Because we know so little, economists and policymakers should be considerably humbler in their policy prescriptions. Be humble as you approach these problems, and I would submit to you that you'll have more true knowledge than many of the people that do today work at the central bank. So I want to talk about an aspect of monetary policy that, in my opinion, hasn't been receiving enough attention as of late. From the end of the period, or well, I should say from the beginning of the period that we call the Great Moderation, roughly 1983 to 2003, there was more or less a consensus on what monetary policy was, what it could and could not do. The job of the monetary authority was to control the amount of money in the economy, to sort of ride a balancing act between too much inflation on the one hand and too much unemployment on the other hand. The idea was the central bank's job was to adjust what's called the monetary base, right, which is uh, the base literally upon which the banking system is built, but later will expand or contract the monetary uh, the money supply on top of that. But really beyond doing that, central banks didn't have a whole lot to do with the financial sector or the direct allocation of credit or other financial resources. 
the central bank was more or less viewed as a referee in the game of finance. But unfortunately, in my opinion, since the Great Recession, they've taken a much more active role, still claiming to be referees, but now also wanting to be players of the game and favoring particular outcomes over others. And the Great Recession, what we observed was that the central bank, the Federal Reserve, moved beyond monetary policy and started engaging in what we might call credit policy. Instead of saying, hey, market, here's the liquidity that you need to make sure that resources are allocated efficiently, we're going to step back and let you do your thing, now they're actually picking the winners and losers. You might have heard of the policy too big to fail. The idea is there are some financial institutions that are so large and so well connected that we simply cannot risk those financial institutions going bankrupt because it will send ripples all throughout the financial system and we're worried about the system as a whole collapsing. As well founded as those theories might be, think about what the central bank is telling large and well connected financial institutions. If you're in trouble, if it looks like your portfolio is going to go belly up, we're going to step in and rescue you. What does that do to your incentives for taking risk? <clears throat> There's a phenomenon in economics that's called moral hazard, which basically means when you're insured against a risk, you're more likely to go and take that risk in the first place. A particularly colorful uh, example might be you take out a life insurance policy on yourself to protect your family in case something happens, and now that you're protected, you decide, you decide hey, maybe I'll take up skydiving as a hobby. Well, when the insurance company insured you, they didn't know that you were going to also be engaging in a dangerous hobby. If they had, your premiums would have been higher. Applying to central banking and bailing out financial institutions, think about the optimal policy for making money for your shareholders if you're the CEO or some other high executive of Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or any of the other banks that either failed or were helped out in the financial crisis. So if we load up on a very risky portfolio and it makes a lot of money, we get to keep it. If we load up on a very risky portfolio and that risk blows up in our faces, the government's going to st step in and underwrite our losses. How does that affect your incentives for taking risk? How would you behave in Vegas if Warren Buffett would bankroll you? I'm guessing that you would gamble and you would gamble big. It's a perfectly rational response to the public sector stepping in and saying we're not going to allow you to experience the consequences of your risk, the consequences of your failure. So we, wouldn't, we shouldn't be so surprised that the financial system has loaded up on so much risk. Now that's not only the fault of the Federal Reserve, it's also the fault of the Treasury. Those two organizations in conjunction have sort of stepped in to bail out various well-connected financial institutions with well-founded fears, but unfortunately those fears have had very pernicious consequences. That's one aspect of credit policy. Another peculiar policy we saw in the financial crisis was the central bank, the Federal Reserve, looking to take bad assets off of connected financial institutions books. So we all know that in 2000 and 2008, most of the crisis was in housing markets, and in particular, financial assets that were derivatives off of mortgages, the so-called mortgage-backed securities. Right, a mortgage is a loan, which also means it's a financial asset. You get a bunch of mortgages together, you put them in a single pool, you bundle them up, that supposedly spreads the risk, and now you have a sort of mutual fund for mortgages. That's mortgage-backed securities in a nutshell. Those are the assets that went bad in the financial crisis. So the Federal Reserve, as part of its troubled asset relief program, and then later after various rounds, I'm sorry, that was the Treasury. So I should say the Federal Reserve in various rounds of quantitative easing, that was the Fed policy, quantitative easing, took mortgage-backed securities off of banks' books. They bought them from them, basically. But then the Federal Reserve also started doing something pretty interesting. They started paying banks interest on excess reserves. Every bank that's a member of the Federal Reserve System has a bank account at the central bank. The original role of central bank was a bank to bankers. So if you're a member of the Federal Reserve System, your bank has a bank account at the Fed. So the Fed would buy your bad assets and then pay you money in the form of interest to keep that new money in a banking account. All of a sudden, you have an organization, a public organization, the Federal Reserve, engaged in its own kind of financial intermediation. It's no longer just supplying liquidity to the system. It's specifically trying to allocate resources by saying, OK, Bank X, we want this mix of assets on your books, and we want you to do Y with the money. There is a phrase that we use to describe that kind of non-market direct allocation of resources. It's not monetary policy. It's fiscal policy. The Federal Reserve, in the course of the financial crisis, has started assuming powers 
which it never had exercised before in any noticeable degree. And that's really worrying because it means the line between monetary policy and fiscal policy is being blurred. That's very important because the objectives of those two kinds of policies are very different. The goal of monetary policy is to give the market what it needs to work. Again, you're a cornerstone or a referee. The idea of fiscal policy is to facilitate a specific allocation of resources. You're no longer just a referee. You're a player. You're an interested party. And to the extent that we have a so-called revolving door between the Federal Reserve branches and Wall Street, and you only need to check who's actually running the Federal Reserve banks to see that largely these personnel are the same, you might be worried that even though these people are, have the best information, and even though they're well-intentioned, they're creating this economic sounding board where all the interested parties are simply talking to each other and thinking about, well, what's good for the big banks must be good for the nation. Right, it's a rehash of the 1970s fallacy. What's good for General Motors must be good for the nation. Well, no, not always. Sometimes what's good for both is good for both. Sometimes what's good for one isn't good for the other. And that's particularly worrying because it means that the central bank is now less engaged in creating the conditions necessary for markets to do all they can to serve us, but more interested in picking specific winners and losers. The rise of so-called macroprudential policy in the aftermath of the financial crisis has basically been people of authority in uh, central banking and financial regulation saying it's not just our job to give the market the liquidity it needs to run. We have to actively shepherd the market along. That should worry you. It's unprecedented. It's on a scale that we haven't seen before, and it's not entirely clear that a large centralized bureaucracy, the central bank or the treasury for that matter, has the information it needs to do that job well. You're talking about the essence of humility. I can't think of something less humble than thinking, OK, we're going to have this one organization or a small group of organizations be in charge of the entire financial health of a country. How do you manage the system like that? The answer is you can't. It's true that you could so overregulate the thing that there's simply no chance that you could have another financial crisis. Just like if I went up to a runner and I hit his knees with a baseball bat, I could ensure that he could never run. I'm worried about him running because I'm worried about him falling over. So if I stop him from running, I know he'll never trip and stumble. But that's pretty much a case of the cure being worse than the disease, don't you think? At best, we're trading slow, anemic growth for this foreseeable future just for getting rid of the risk of another financial crisis. And if I'm right in my previous talk, you can't even chalk up financial crises just due to the market alone. You have to have some role for the public sector that comes in to mess with markets and unanchor market actors' expectations. So not only is the public sector the source of the disease, it's also introducing the cure, which is worse than the disease. I don't think that any significant progress on these matters are going to be made until people have an accurate understanding of what a central bank is, what monetary policy is, and most importantly, what it is not. A lot of people think, oh, monetary policy, that's just what the central bank does. No, it has a very specific meaning. Central banks are entrusted with a very specific mandate. And like all organizations, when they step beyond that mandate, they are operating unlawfully. I think that that's what we really need to pay attention to in the coming years. Yes, young man. Uh, yeah. Um, are any of the presidential candidates talking about monetary policy in any meaningful way? Except for all of us? Or? Whoever wants to jump in. Well, you talked about this in class this morning, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll start us off. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I haven't been following the election all that closely. From what I have seen, uh, Ted Cruz has said some favorable things about the gold standard, but it's been pretty abstract. It's just been the idea of the dollars are using purchasing power, the dollar should be gold. Two perfectly reasonable propositions, of course. It's just that I would like to see something more well developed. It's one thing to say the dollar should be gold, it's another thing to say, here's my plan for getting us there. And if your plan for getting there is not well thought out, again, the cure can be worse than the disease. I'm also not surprised to see uh, Rand Paul uh, fighting the good fight on monetary policy, given his family history and the experience that his father has had on the campaign trail with his End the Fed books, his Audit the Fed campaign, and his exposure to Austrian economics. So those are the two most prominent candidates that I've seen talking about that. Uh, to my knowledge, other candidates haven't really been talking about reforming the US monetary system. Bernie Sanders. I, I think Bernie Sanders, Sanders wants, Sanders wants to break the banks. The banks. The banks. No. He wants to break the big banks up. So I guess the logic there would be there is no more too big to fail. 
Right? If there are a bunch of small banks, then there's no risk of running any one bank failing. And there's a certain amount of logic to that. I don't disagree that if you have a bunch of small banks as opposed to just a few big banks, you don't have to worry as much about any one of them going belly up. Uh, the thing that I question, though, is we see healthy financial systems throughout history that are characterized by a very small number of large financial institutions. Case in point is Canada. Now, Canada's had a very healthy financial system all throughout its history, but in comparison to the US, its financial industry is much more concentrated. And yet they seem to have avoided the worst things of associated with recessions and financial crises that you would see in the US, which suggests that you don't need to forcibly break up banks in order to prevent them from not too big to fail. All the public sector needs to do is credibly commit to not helping them if they do stupid things, in which case they'll think, oh, if we take too much risk, then Uncle Sam's not going to step in and help us out. So they might do it anyway by accident, in which case you still have a problem. That is a problem. But they're not going to systematically err on the side of taking too much risk like they are now. Because again, to the extent that someone else is underwriting your losses, yeah, why not load up on risk? But the coin, if it works, you're rich. You're rich. And if it doesn't work, well, it's the taxpayer's problem. So I think that more than, more than downsides in financial institutions, we need to get to a public commitment of not bailing out financial institutions and businesses in general when they don't work out. And we can talk about a social safety net that might provide for the individuals who find themselves in those unfortunate circumstances. Reasonable people can disagree on that. I don't think there's any good case for direct bailouts of financial institutions or businesses in general. I think Sanders also wants a commodity standard based on uh, maple syrup and Ben Jerry's ice cream. Right? <laughs> um, no, but no, seriously, I mean, I think and, uh, I was going to ask you that question, though. I mean, how much do you think that the current you know, structure of the banking industry is, is based on recent monetary policy? You seem to indicate some of it is, but do you think it would be radically different if you had a different type of monetary system? Bank, would be, bank In terms would be less of number of banks and concentration? Yeah. Yeah, I do think that because of some publicly imposed barriers, regulation, red tape, that sort of thing, those sorts of things tend to select for larger institutions. Right? It's not really hard to see why. Regulation of a business by the public sector usually takes the form of a fixed cost. If you want to do any business in the industry at all, you must comply with XYZ rules. That doesn't matter if you produce one unit or a million units. Everyone has to do it. But what kinds of organizations are best able to cope with fixed costs? answer, big organizations that already exist, precisely because if you produce a lot of output, each one of those units of output can absorb a smaller fraction of that fixed cost. So to the extent that the financial system is a quote unquote rigged game and does favor big concentrated banks over a larger number of smaller banks, how large that effect is, I don't know. I'm actually inclined to think that given the complexity of a bunch of valid financial instruments such as derivatives these days and the economies of scale that might exist with coming, uh, with pairing investment banking with commercial banking, my intuitions would be that even in a completely free market for finance and banking, you would still tend to see relatively high industry concentration. And I think that's just due to the nature of financial products that are on the market today. So I, I would be skeptical with characterizing the health of a financial system based off of how many firms there are and how big each individual firm is. I think much more fruitful would be to ask, provided they find themselves in a tricky spot, can they expect to be bailed out? Do they have to play by the same rules as everybody else? If the answer to that question is yes, my intuition is that the system is sound, even if there's only a small number of large firms. Craig, you want to add anything to that? No. All right. Other questions? I think Jacob, you handled last time. Yeah, so it has to do with the moral hazard. And, uh, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit that we have to credibly signal that we're not going to bail out these big financial institutions. So. Given that, how do you propose that we give a credible signal that that's not going to happen anymore without letting you know, some banks fail? Or, or is it going to take you know, having another financial crisis and Bank of America failing? Short answer, I have no idea. Long answer, the long answer is slightly more complicated. So a couple of famous money and banking historians, uh, Charles Calamiris and I don't remember the other gentleman's first name, but his last name I believe is Haber had a book out in 2014, which is called Fragile by Design, in which they look at banking crises and financial crises across countries. And what they observe is that banking and financial crises are primarily political in origin and have to do with the structure of the financial system. And that, two, 
the structure of the financial system depends on the strength of interest groups versus populist interests versus all the other interest groups that you might find in society. So the reason that Canada had a healthy financial system was actually due to the fact that there was no populist farming, there wasn't as large a populist farming anti-banking sentiment as in the United States. Right? So in the early days of the United States, due to anti-banking sentiment, there were actually some regulations placed on banks that made it harder for them to stabilize the macro economy. If you had a bank, you were only allowed to have one branch. You couldn't have multiple branches, which means that you were subject to geographic specific risk. If you're a bank in a Midwestern state, and you're, there's a bad crop, and the farmers can't repay all the loans that you've made them, your bank goes belly up. On the other hand, if you had a, bran a branch in San Francisco, you can wire that branch and say, hey, transfer me some emergency liquidity. I'm having a hard time. That option was out. There are also rules forbidding banks from increasing the money supply or decreasing it as needed to meet macroeconomic conditions. Due to the different interest groups that existed in Canada, those policies didn't exist. So it's tempting to say that the health of a banking system can be traced back to the interest groups that are actually determining the rules. I like that explanation. The problem is that it's perfectly deterministic. You either have the right interest groups or you don't. There's no room for ideas. There's no room for persuasion in the public sphere. And so I'm not completely comfortable with that sort of an explanation. I think that in order for any meaningful change to happen to our money and banking institutions, there needs to be widespread public understanding of exactly what's going on moral hazard wise. Right? You can't just say, oh, the market's failed. You need to understand, yes, but that's because this very bad set of rules, which the market is not responsible for crafting, we have to lay the blame where it belongs. The blame might properly belong in subset to the market, but certainly not all of it. We also have to look at politics. And there needs to be some organized force, actually in the thick of it policy-wise, that's capable of countering the banking lobby and big banking interests. They like being bailed out. They like being regulated. Lots of banking regulation means it's hard for competition to come in and take their business. It is one of the greatest fallacies that businesses don't like to be regulated. They love to be regulated. It keeps competition out. It keeps profits high. So we need to fight the battle for ideas in the public square, like get the ideas out among the people, and then we also need to find a way for the policy think tanks to make an inroad in more closed shop policy circles. How you actually do that? Well, now you come up against the limit of my knowledge. And so I'm, not, I'm not a think tank expert or a policy expert in that sense. I, I was just going to ask a question along similar lines, and that is with the uh, proclivity of the of the banks and the regulators to get together, and I throw in that mix also the politicians. What is an economist's view of breaking that up, other than doing what you're doing here today, and that is education, so more people understand the difference between monetary policy, and fiscal policy. What do you do beyond that? that Rand Paul can't do, or hasn't done. He read long notes. I do read long notes. pretty loud. Well. You know, make, make a point. <clears throat> There's a lot of community banks in Arkansas that if you speak to a community banker, an employee, they're, they're small banks that they're affected by this process that you just described. They, they especially as it pertains to Dodd-Frank, the rules are written so that by the politicians so that big banks can comply, but the costs of complying are so great for the small banks that they, it's a very huge burden and they'll talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And so to your, to your question, again, educating the public and making them aware that this even exists because many people don't, aren't aware that this is going on and that it exists. Would like to address that also? Yes. One thing, what do you think about, you know, since you are, know more about Arkansas policy, I mean, what do you think about trying to have some way for the community banks to be coordinated? Because I think now a lot of them have, you know, policy views, but they're very, you know, community banks across the country don't have a lot of, you know, national lobbying or something like that, whereas the, the big national banks do. You know, one of the, on the second floor, a lot of the, the couple community banks in Arkansas have, you know, advertisements, and I noticed I was at the bottom of one that got tarp, and then, like, it crossed out, right? Like, they're anti-TARP, right? And so a lot of community banks are opposed to these type of policies, but maybe they're not coordinated enough to um, create some sort of voice. Is that, I think, I think that's an issue, or? I think, I think the community banks in Arkansas do a pretty good job of, of communicating their concerns. I've watched them in various forums, including forums where there were Federal Reserve officials. They've, they've made a pretty strong case that these policies affect them and 
and their employees and their customers. So one extreme and slightly radical alternative is to bypass the ordinary policy process and go straight from the level of the meta rules. If you can't get change within ordinary politics, well, you change the rules by which ordinary politics takes place. The Constitution has in it a mechanism by which the people of the several states can demand a constitutional convention. So if you can't demand the established representative, if you can't convince the established representatives because they're being lobbied too much the other way, maybe you could get a widespread grassroots movement on these issues sufficiently large that that becomes, the threat of that at least becomes a sufficiently strong possibility that that compels the people's representatives to take action even against uh, the entrenched interests of the banking lobbies. That's playing with fire though. I'm not sure how. Because once you, once you light that fuse, anything, anything, will, anything could happen at that convention. Right? Anything could happen at that convention. Once you light that fuse, you can no longer control it. When there have been historical instances in which mass populist movements have done good things. Much more common is mass po populist movements having done very, very bad things. So, because prohibition, yeah. prohibition was the only amendment that took place by the states. Right? I think it was, yeah. yeah. Which was a good amendment, but, or, or prohibition repeal, excuse me. Yeah. Um, was the only one, I think. So yeah, the, the Constitutional Convention option via the difference. people of the several states is basically the political equivalent of the nuclear option. So be very, very careful if you go that route. But it is a possibility. There are some people that hold the view that you, you just have to get rid of the Fed. What's your view? I think that without, an, so that might be the start of a conversation, but I don't think it can be the end of a conversation. It's kind of like get rid of Obamacare, right? Well, what's, what's going to replace it? Right. That, the devil is in the details with all of these plans. If you repeal the Federal Reserve, okay, well, what happens to the Federal Reserve <clears throat> system? There's an entire series of institutional architecture that even if you get rid of the FOMC and the people who actually make monetary policy decisions, well, what do you do with all this leftover junk? What happens to the dollar? Right. How are checks cleared? How are checks cleared? The Federal Reserve op also operates a check clearing system between member banks. If you pull out a banknote out of your wallet and read it, it says it's a liability of the Federal Reserve. Interestingly, dollar notes are liabilities of the Fed, and dollar coins are liabilities of the, I'm sorry, coins like nickels and quarters and dimes are liabilities of the Treasury, so that's an interesting historical holdover. So the question is, it's all well and good to say we want to get rid of this centralized banking system, but what do you replace it with? And most importantly, how do you manage the transition to whatever it is you're going to? So, and the Fed can be a political rallying cry. It can be the start of a conversation, but unless you really want to mess up your banking system, it should never be the end of a conversation. Jason. I have a question. Um, how much is it being attributed to the business cycle? Um, I read research by Christopher Sims, a Nobel lawyer in 2011. Uh, he's, he believed that from his findings that there was, um, I wrote it down, uh, Little observed um, post-war cyclical variation is attributed to exogenous variation in monetary policy, and real effects are smaller and less certain than uh, previously believed. Uh, with his findings, how does that stand with what you uh, believe? So if he's right and I'm wrong about the source of the business cycle, then admittedly the particular problems associated with cyclical fluctuations become less important but you still have financial crises to worry about. Right? As long as there's too big to fail, banks are going to be engaging in irresponsible behavior. Right? So you might have to worry about the Federal Reserve causing boom and bust cycles less. You still have to worry about the Fed and the Treasury together underwriting the losses of poorly behaved banks. Right? To the extent that that's going to create a financial system whereby well-connected insiders play by different rules, that's obviously gonna create a lot of resentment and it's gonna be a drag on growth for obvious reasons, because the efficiency of the capital allocation sector is going to be hampered by these rules that distribute economic profits not on the basis of merit in the marketplace, but on the basis of political pull. So I think it's just a change in emphasis. Even if it could be proved beyond a shadow of the doubt that the Austrian cycle of the business, uh, the Austrian theory of the business cycle were wrong, you would still have all these financial concerns to worry about. And I actually do agree that the latter are more of a concern. Right? So that's where most of our efforts should be located. So to illustrate his point, in 1998, in 2001, there was a recession from March to November. But three years before that, in 1998, there was a financial crisis uh, like he just described. The financial crisis, if you go back and read about it, you'll see that the Federal Reserve was bailing out big banks. 
and also a well-known hedge fund, long-term capital management was at the center of that. So those kind of crises go on when there aren't recessions. And you should be asking yourself the question, why, why, and sh why are they bailing out these types of big institutions? But aren't most bailouts fiscal rather than monetary? Most big bailouts of hedge funds? Yeah, banks and stuff like that. The money comes from fiscal side. It sometimes does. Uh, the long-term capital management bailout was the Fed. The Continental Illinois bailout in 1984, I believe it was 84. It's either 87 or 84, and I think 84. That was also the Federal Reserve. So sometimes it's the Treasury doing it. Sometimes it's the Federal Reserve. Um, either way, it doesn't really matter which one's doing it for the purposes of the health of the financial system. But you worry more, I think, if the Fed does it because of those two organizations, Fed and Treasury, only one has the authority to print money out of thin air. Right? If the Treasury bails someone out, it has to get that money from somewhere. Can't they print coins out of Thin air. Okay, so they could technically they could mint up seven trillion quarters and then hand them or, or one them. big trillion dollar coin, right? Uh, well, that's the Paul yes. Krugman point, yeah. right? Actually, I, I got a question Touché. about that. I think we had to hand over here first, but we'll, we'll come to you next. Um, yeah, go ahead. My question was about um, you're talking about the financial crisis and the recession and everything beginning in 2008, and maybe I'm a little confused on exactly how this works, but. If the banks had failed and the government hadn't bailed them out, wouldn't they have had to pay the money anyway because of FDIC? So therefore, they still would have had to pay money. So it, in a sense, makes a little bit, the banks are irresponsible regardless, but would it still not have made sense for them to prop the banks up? Maybe the regulation need, would need to come as far as limiting the risks that they're able to take. Um, for instance, uh, like the, the movie, I can't remember the movie that's out right now that actually talks about the financial crisis and then people knew that the banks were going to fail. Yeah, they knew that the banks were, people knew the banks were going to fail and, you know, in the preview there's the girl who's like, yeah, I've got like five houses, <laughs> you know, and she's talking about all this stuff. The banks were literally just giving loans out and knowing good and well that these people couldn't pay it. But if you go back in time to, you know, 80s, 90s, it was very, very difficult to get a loan for something. I mean, you almost said that have the business built, you know, in order for them to give you some money for that. Um, so, wouldn't the regulation really need to come as far as uh, regulating what the banks are spending the money on, as opposed to just I think I overall? Yeah, sorry, I don't know how to get to where I'm trying to go. With that, but one thing you can do is you can have a policy of, of when the FDIC bails out depositors specifically, uh, whereas when we're talking about other bailouts, we're talking about actually bailing out the banks. So even in a normal year, I mean, if you look at the FDIC's website, there's two or three banks that fail every week, small community banks. And what happens is they shut the bank down, and some other community bank typically will then take over all those accounts. So the bank and the owners of the bank and the creditors of the bank, they lose their money because they were you know, a business that was not operating profitably. But the depositors, right, the average citizens, they don't lose their money, right? So that's what the, you can have an FDIC, which protects depositors, but still allow banks to fail, right? So you can you can separate those two um, and still allow the institution to fail without the depositors being harmed. Right, because... <coughs> Which is right. often, it's done every week, basically. But, and see, that's the confusion of the public, of course, you know, the way it's spun, is yeah. if the banks are failing, everyone automatically thinks, I'm gonna lose all my money. Right. You know, and that's what, you know, the public generally thinks, because we're missing more, which is, you know, why this is such a great thing to get these types of things explained. <laughs> you could be misinformed, or it could be we're just not doing a very good job of doing the informing. I tend to think it's a little bit of both. But with respect to deposit insurance, there's actually an interesting solution that gets the same goal, where depositors are made whole, but you don't get any of the costs associated with deposit insurance. So the cost of deposit insurance is that once your deposits are insured by Uncle Sam, depositors don't have a very strong incentive to monitor the health of the bank. There was a time before deposit insurance where depositors, people who put their money in banks, would actually say, hey bank, what are you investing in? Are you fiscally sound? If not, I'm withdrawing my money and taking it elsewhere. So the question is, if we want to make sure that depositors are looked after, but we uh, want to get rid of the fact that with deposit insurance, that responsibility mechanism is eroded, we have what's called the option of incorporating extended liability. Now in the Western world, uh, it might surprise you to learn that the limited liability corporation apply to all businesses. Anyone can be an LLC if you want to. 
<coughs> yeah. It used to be that in Scotland, for example, if you wanted to open a bank, you could do that, but you could not incorporate on a limited liability basis unless you had special permission for the government. What does that mean? It means that if you owned a bank in Scotland and that bank failed, your personal wealth was on the line to make depositors whole if your bank failed. Right? Under an LLC today, if the bank fails, you can go only go after whatever assets the company has left. You couldn't go after the personal wealth of the owners. In Scotland, you could go after the personal wealth of the owners up until all of your debts were paid. Now, you can bet that gave banks a very strong incentive not to behave too riskily, because all of a sudden, you know, if Lord so-and-so is a major holder of a bank in Scotland and the bank fails, then suddenly he might have to sell his estate to pay off all the depositors. And the United States before the Federal Reserve, and I think even for a couple of years after, uh, banks in the national or state banking system were often forced to incorporate on a double or triple limited uh, liability basis which means that if the bank went belly up, you could go after the personal wealth of the owners for up to three times your initial stake. Right? So if you were owed $1 by the bank and the bank fails and doesn't have enough assets on its book to make you whole, you could go after the personal wealth of the owners for up to $3 worth of whatever your shares were worth. So that's an intermediate case between limited liability, in which case you can only go after the wealth of the corporation as a separate person, and unlimited liability. Right. So having banks banking be double, triple, or even unlimited liability forces banks to internalize the cost of their risks, and it also makes sure that people who are debtors of the creditors of the bank, right? Whenever you have a bank account, you are giving a bank a loan. So if you have a checking or a savings account, you're loaning the bank money. Any of its depositors have a reasonable expectation of at least partially being made whole if the bank fails. So you get the good effects of deposit insurance with none of the costs. Now those liability regimes also have costs. Some people contend that they make banking less vigorous and dynamic, and those can be talked about. But generally, I think that the older solutions to money and banking problems make the most sense, precisely because there wasn't a sophisticated in institutional architecture that existed to separate individuals from the cost of their bad decisions. I think it's a little more on the, on the history um, is, uh even during the Great Depression, when something like 13,000 banks failed, so depending on how you measure it, like half of all banks failed, uh, deposits were still, there was no FDIC yet, uh, but 95% of depositors were made full, uh, were made whole. So even in a system where you didn't have deposit insurance, um, because banks have assets and people want to buy those up, uh, most of depositors were fine, even though half of all banks failed. Greg, were you going to say something too? Just so when he says owner, correct me if I'm wrong, you also include shareholders. <coughs> yeah, shareholders. The shareholders. Yeah, that's what I mean. So substitute shareholder for owner. So if you owned one share of Bank of America, <coughs> Bank of America was an unlimited liability bank, they could go after an unlimited amount of that share up to the total value of the share. But since it's only one share, it's not very much to you, right? It matters most for the people who have the most skin in the game, which is exactly what you would want to align the sentence, right, if you're worried about excessive risk taking. Yeah, I, I kind of got a question. Um, since our country is $21.5 trillion in debt, we have $100 trillion in unfin un unfunded liabilities. If we theoretically did, say, print, say, three, four, even five, you know, three, four, five trillion dollar bills, ones that we know that other economies could not cash and we wouldn't cash ourselves, and then we switched our monetary policy to a different type of currency. Uh, what kind of uh, effect would that have worldwide versus what would we actually save as far as paying back? I mean, I believe we're at the point where we can service the interest on our debt. We're at the point of no return. And when you got $21 trillion in debt, uh, I mean, that's actually worth more than the total assets of the country when you think about it. Especially when you figure the, 100, 100, 100, uh, the $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities. So. With a system where we're going, where basically you have a constitutional way to fiat counterfeit currency making, it's not working. If we try something radical to go to something new, maybe even back to a gold standard. Um, I mean, the most radical would just be to repudiate the debt. Why do this phony thing where, oh, we'll print a $3 trillion bill. You just say, okay, we're not paying it off anymore. I mean, the you know, kind of short and medium term consequence of that is the federal government couldn't borrow any money for a very long time. But <laughs> maybe that's not such a bad thing. Yes, um, <laughs> um, But um, I don't know, I mean, on the point of debt service, I mean, thanks to historically low interest rates, partially due to the Federal Reserve, 
I mean, debt service as a percent of the federal budget is like the lowest it's been in decades. Yeah, but now we, that may change. Uh, but you take back when the Federal Reserve was, was created, dollars worth about three cents, maybe three and a half cents from when the Federal Reserve was created. So you've had a ninety-six percent loss in value of, of your currency in less than or right at a hundred years. Yeah, I mean that's you know those graphs I handed out. I I fully concede that point, but uh, for the most part, that's been predictable, right? What's what's really dangerous is is unpredictable losses of value in the currency. And if it's predictable, you know, two or five percent a year, whatever it is, as long as it's stable and predictable, it's, it's not as much a concern. So what concerns me is more variable inflation where it's unknown rather than cumulative over a hundred years. Uh, but I don't know if you guys have a different take on that. Just an observation. You, I believe you made the remark it's just not working right now. And the economy really isn't working very well. It's it's growing at a very low rate, a little over two percent. The jobs aren't being created, the incomes aren't rising. So it's really not working and I guess I would well I would encourage you as you think about monetary policy to put it in the context of it's just not working. Monetary policy is contributing to it not working. The current monetary policy. So depending on how you count a default. Uh, the United States government has already defaulted on its debt throughout its history between six and 12 times. Right? The devil is in the details, which means that, okay, if the United States was on the gold standard at X dollars per one ounce of gold, and then it goes to a standard where it's easier to meet, right? so more dollars buys you the same amount of gold, does that count as a repudiation? Does that count as a default? Some people say yes, some people say no. Right? So in the most conservative case, the U.S. has defaulted six times since the inception of the nation under more expansive criteria of defaults, the nation has defaulted 12 times. So it's not like a default on the national debt is completely <coughs> unprecedented. That being said, given how much of world financial portfolios depend on treasuries as the safe asset, right, the risk-free rate of return, that would be a, you're talking about the crash of the financial system, that would be it. So the short-run consequences of that would be really, really, really severe. And I think we need to think twice about, again, that's, the, that's another nuclear option. It might be, if we keep kicking the can down the road, eventually it might be the only option available. But I think we should think hard about maybe doing something less extreme, if at all possible. But you think at some point it might be to the point where it's better to cut off the arm than to lose the entire body? If we get to that point, then yeah, that's the only solution that we have. So how, how do we know when we're at that point? Is there, is there something we could look to, like interest rates or something? <coughs> yes, so when... I think when you can look at, if interest rates on the debt are persistently above the growth rate of GDP, then you're really in trouble. Because then debt servicing is growing, and not only growing, but diverging further and further from the tax base, which is what you use to pay off the debt. Right? So it's basically the national equivalent of only paying off the minimum amount on your credit card every month. And once we're in that territory, yeah, we're in big trouble. So comparing nominal growth rates and nominal interest rates? Yes. Okay. So That's the uh, unpleasant monetarist arithmetic paper by Sargent and I don't remember who the other. So if you have growth at about 1.5 percent based on monetary and fiscal policy, which is I think what you said earlier in your talk, and you have uh, interest rates that would probably seek the norm, which is around 2.53 percent on the debt servicing, we're going to be in a crisis mode probably rather soon. Oh, well, the one and a half percent growth is real growth, right? Yeah, the one and a half percent growth we're observing is real growth. Nominal growth would be about three, three, three percent, right? Yeah, yeah. So you got to make sure that you're comparing like growth rates to like. It's either got to be real to real or nominal to nominal. Um, and because interest rates are so low right now, and I actually think the reason that interest rates are so low, so low right now is due to the weak state of the economy. Interest rates have been so low for so long that it's no longer, in my view, plausible to attribute that to monetary policy on the part of the Fed. Again, I said in my talk that uh, monetary policy can affect interest rates, but only in the short run. If you observe low interest rates for five, six, seven years, you should probably be looking to the real state of the economy. So right now, we're not in that worry point yet, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything, right? You wanna do something before you get to the worry point. And so I think that if there was a comprehensive way of actually affecting this change, a sort of unified program would probably involve refinancing, so to speak, a large part of the national debt at lower interest rates, and also transitioning to a hard commodity standard to credibly commit to keeping the purchasing power of money on a reasonable growth path. 
and then you could get to an institutional setting where you could regularly expect the growth rate of GDP to exceed the growth rate, to exceed the interest service cost on the debt, which means that even if you only pay back a regular amount each time period, the absolute size of the debt will fall. So a country has a little bit more slack than a private organization, so that's sometimes a boon, but also sometimes it's a cause for worry because it precisely means that elected officials and bureaucrats don't have to exercise the same responsibility that a private organization would, which is kind of why we're here in the first place. So navigating those trade-offs has probably got to involve some amount of financial refinancing and some amount of genuine, long-lasting institutional reform. So okay, is the policy, are they enacting or making a new policy so when this happens, we've seen in history that you can the policies can change or the, the systems can change, so why are we not working on, or are we working on a new policy and who's making the regulations for these policies? Um, I mean, one, and this you kind of emphasize this in your, your talk, is that uh, you know, a lot of the policy is kind of made up ad hoc on the fly. Uh, you know, what are we going to do when the financial crisis comes? We'll, we'll make it up when we get there. And uh, so as far as who's making the policy, uh, I think a lot of it's being done through not the normal constitutional legal channels. Um, now as far as who's working on policy alternatives, the policies we might use, uh, there's all kinds of alternative ideas out there in your talk you gave us. you know. At least two distinct ones, but probably lots of other, or three distinct ones, and possibly other uh, variations. But um, yeah, I don't know. You guys want to try and find too? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, so, one thing that's really worried me about the latter part of 20th century legislation, uh, 21st century legislation, not just monetary policy legislation, is how broad it is. It's frequently detailed in the sense that there is a lot of nits in the actual legislation, the document to pick, and there's a lot of pages. But if you're talking about creating a new organization, the language is very broad. It almost places no structures on what uh, the law is intended to do. What that means is the actual content of the law is after the fact filled in by NGOs and lobbyists and think tanks, etc. So to the extent that that's happening, Congress actually has very little control over what the finished product looks like. It's not an exaggeration to say that the executive agencies are almost writing more of the laws than the Congress. That should worry you because that's not exactly how it's supposed to work, constitutionally speaking. The people who are writing the laws governing how the financial sector works, again, Congress writes the laws, the people who fill in the content is mostly the central banks and the financial lobbyists and the banks themselves and the various regulatory agencies that have sprung up since the financial crisis. That should worry you, I think, because they are not neutral parties. Right, they have an interest in the rules being one way as opposed to another way. I don't know what institutional change you could do short of a radical reset of the kind that I proposed that could sort of sweep the vested interests out and get legislative control over these institutional processes again. Uh, I know I can name a lot of finished products that look pretty good. Gold standard and GDP targeting, completely free banking. How to actually get there in light of current political constraints is a problem that I think is beyond the wisdom of Solomon. I have no idea. Do you have any insights off on that? Uh, <clears throat> sometimes this idea of a commodity-based, uh, like a gold standard, is, is uh, poo-pooed, but Alan Greenspan was the chairman of the Federal Reserve. And in 1980, 81, he wrote a column for the Wall Street Journal, and he, ex he explained in detail how you would do it. It's, it's not easy, but there's a step-by-step -step process that you would do. And, and so it's important to be aware of that and, and talk about it. And don't forget, too, that in the 1970s, when there was a lot of inflation, there was a commission that was set up to study this problem. And they did, in fact, do that when Reagan was president. Uh, and they came out with the report. It was the Gold Commission. There were two reports. And so it's important to have these kind of talks because there is a problem. And now, if I could just throw this idea out too, we're talking today about inflation and, and rates going up. But think about the opposite. Think about negative interest rates. Think about you having to pay a bank for the money you have on deposit at their bank. It's, it's already happening in Europe. And if you go into the Federal Reserve's literature in the last few years, there are many articles to talk about this. That's, that's a pretty far out idea to most people. 
but it's possible that it could happen. And so to have these common conversations and to think about these ideas, it's really important. Sorry, right, that's not the most satisfying answer. <laughs> so we don't know the answer. If I had the answer worked out, I'd go to the presses. But we have circulated some of his blog posts, so you know, go ahead and read those. And it inspire you to uh, So, uh, hello, uh, my name is Tom, and I'm from this uh, Andrew class, uh, I'm actually in economics. So, there are two main things I want to ask you a question. The first thing is about uh, value of the dollar. As you can know that uh, in 1945, the World War II, right? So, we, we, we made lots of dollars from selling lots of weapons, right? And I, as, as you can see, that there is the huge decreasing in the value of dollars, and it, and it was about nearly 70 years, right? And I want to ask you guys a question that such a long time like this, so why don't we make some solutions? I mean, in other words, what are the factors that can help to rise the value of dollars? And I know that one of the reasons was about financial crisis, but I just want to ask you guys that uh, what are some uh, factors that can help to rise the value of dollar again? Okay, uh, that's the first thing. Uh, that's the first thing I want to ask you. The second thing I want to ask you is about the position of the U.S. now. So as you can know, that is the huge rise uh, from China uh, economy or uh, from India economy or uh, from some developing countries that they can threaten the position of the U.S. So do, do you guys think that the position of U.S. now are being threatened or not? That's all. Uh, to be honest, I, I'm glad that I can ask you guys those questions. And I don't know who I should ask those questions. So it depends on you guys who, uh, who can answer my questions. Well, yes, a, thank you. It's a very good question. It's probably enough to chew on there to get us through the last 12 minutes. So yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll answer the first question real quick. <clears throat> to have a stronger dollar, you need to have a monetary policy that's tighter. Uh, like, uh, that isn't as loose, that isn't engaged in the types of uncon unconventional, radical policies that have been engaged in the last seven years. The last seven years. years. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, especially since, especially since the, the Great Recession, but the Fed has now raised rate, the short rate for the first time. The, uh, the, uh, the short rate has, has been raised for the first time in seven years. Doing that more will cost the dollar to increase in value. Yeah, I think as far as increasing value, I mean, if you look at the first in the graphs I handed out, if you look at page two, uh, you'll see there are periods in which the value of the dollar declined. And then it rose again over the next few decades. Um, I mean, the primary thing you need for that to happen is for the economy to grow faster than the money supply is increasing. So that could mean no money supply growth. It could mean slow money supply growth. But the main thing which has caused over the last 70 years the value of the dollar to decline is that the money supply has been growing faster than the economy. So that's the basic answer is that the economy needs to grow faster than the supply of money. And that will, over time, increase the value of the dollar. And there's really no other way to do it. Now, there's lots of monetary policies that will get you there. Um, but that's really the only way the value of the dollar could increase over an extended period of time. The, question, the first question is interesting because it draws attention to the fact that when you see long and persistent inflation over decades, you usually don't observe that in isolation. It's not the only trend that you notice with respect to a country's given currency standard and its finances. Usually, when you observe long inflationary periods, you also observe large rises over that same time period of the public debt. I don't think modern economics has a very good explanation of this, but I think that Adam Smith had a perfectly reasonable explanation of that, which is that when you have political control over, over the money supply, politically, inflation is safer than deflation. Because in the short run, inflation does make it look like that there's a boom in the economy. But in order to keep that boom going, you have to keep inflating. Now put yourself in the perspective of a treasury official. Your job is to issue debt, right? To borrow money for the government. Is it easier to borrow money when there's inflation or deflation? The answer is inflation, because you have to pay back that loan in depreciated dollars. So there's a sort of spontaneous order slash self-reinforcing effect between dollar debasement and deficits of the public sector. They sort of reinforce each other in this vicious cycle. And in order to pin it down, as Dr. Corporatall mentioned, you've got to either 
implement some sort of rule that has a ceiling for the amount of debt that a country can issue, as a percentage of GDP, say, or you need to make it difficult for some authority to depreciate the dollar by, say, pegging it to gold. That's really the only way to break the cycle. Uh, with respect to the rise of China and India, I tend to view those events pretty favorably. I like the existence of other rich trading partners that the US can trade with, because that makes me better off, too. So I tend to see the world economy not as a zero-sum game, but as something that anybody who participates in, so long as they do so honestly and with good intent, can also win. So if China gets richer, that means they have more money to buy my, my stuff, which means that I get richer, which means I can buy more of their stuff, and everybody gets richer. So I'd rather have a world with more rich people in it than fewer. And so to the extent that that poses a threat to American economic dominance, I say, great. Well, and, and not just because we can trade with them, but because there are two and a half billion human beings there who have been living in grinding poverty for a long time. Thanks, they can get out of poverty too, right? You're right, um, but they're all high because I see how it's going. No, no, no. I know, I know you meant that. You just didn't say it. Shame. But, but yeah, I mean, I mean, if it means that the U.S. is this place as the largest economy or the wealthiest economy, I mean, I mean, I'm not too worried about that. I mean, look at, pick, say, Switzerland or Sweden or Luxembourg. They've never been the dominant economy in the world, but they're all very wealthy, nice places to live. And you know, I think it's it's almost inevitable that both China and India someday will be bigger economies than us by many orders, and they may even have higher income than us in say 200 years. But I guess I'm not worried about that. But I won't be alive in 200 years, so I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something. But.